We're going to jump in to the message this morning uh, and get, make sure that we have ample time to jump into the scriptures today. If you have your Bibles, go with me to three places, Romans chapter 6, Luke chapter 23, and Matthew chapter 13. Romans chapter 6, Luke 23, and Matthew chapter 13. If you'd find your places there. Today I want to preach a sermon that's going to be a little different in some ways for Easter. It's a little out of the norm, but I'm kind of known for that. I want to preach on the subject, as you can see, I want to preach on depravity. Depravity. Everybody shout out depravity. If you don't know what that means, you will in a moment. It's going to seem like I'm starting out on a depressive note, but I'm not. Okay? I'm not starting out on a depressive note. Uh, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but there's some things that we need to talk about in church that we haven't been talking about in church, and we've got too much coochie coochie coo coo in church. We got too much coddlings, too much babying people in church. And we need to hear the truth of God's word because Jesus Christ is coming back very soon. And so today I'm on assignment from the Holy Spirit. Certainly was not what I wanted to preach. I would have loved to preach something else, but this is what the Lord for months has been telling me to preach on today. So I want you to do something with me. Everybody knows every good lawyer first must build a case, right? He has to build his case. So I'm going to build a case, and I want you to promise me this morning that you will rock with me to the end, okay? So if you don't rock with me to the end and I lose you, then you're going to miss something at the very conclusion, okay? So I want you to rock with me to the very end, and we're going to build a case this morning and talk about this subject of depravity, and we're going to tie all this in to the resurrection. Romans chapter 6, if you're there, say amen. Romans chapter 6, and we're going to start reading here. We're actually, we're just going to read one verse in Romans chapter, or chapter 6, verse 23. Very familiar passage. It says, for the wages of sin, I'm reading from New King James, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's go over to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Let's read here. We're going to read several passages here, verses here in Luke chapter 23. We're going to read starting in verse 13, verse 13 of Luke 23. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priest and the rulers and the people, said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things Of which you've accused him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. So this is Passover. This is what we call Easter. And they all cried at once, saying, Away with this man and release Barabbas, who has been thrown into prison for certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. So catch that, he was a murderer. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them, but they shouted again, Crucify him, crucify him. And then he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Do you all see that Pilate is wanting to let Jesus go? But they were insisted, demanding with a loud voice, he must be crucified. And the voices of these men and the chief priest prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested, and he released to them the one they requested, whom, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Now as they led him away, they, led, uh, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from a country... And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of people followed him, and the the woman who also mourned lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourself as for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren women, and never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they began to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if they do these things in the greenwood, what will be done? In the dry, there were also two other criminals led by him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place 
They come to the place called Calvary. There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now let's go over one more place to Matthew chapter 13, if you would go there with me. Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to read in verse 31. Matthew chapter 13, verse 31. I can find my place here. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in a field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it grows into, and one translation says it grows into a great tree and becomes a tree. So the birds of the air come and they nest in its branches. Now, I'm going to tie all of these scriptures together, and it's going to seem like these scriptures have nothing to do with each other, but I promise you they have everything to do with each other, and with the Lord's help, I'm going to tie all of these together. Will you bow your heads and pray with me today? Heavenly Father, we ask that you give us spiritual ears to hear what the Spirit would say to us over the next few moments, and we ask all of this in the precious, wonderful name of our risen Savior, Jesus, and everybody said amen. He is risen. Come on, He is risen. He is risen indeed. indeed. So I want to talk about depravity, total depravity, blessed redemption, the sinfulness of man slash the righteousness of God. These are two very old doctrines. The teaching of total depravity is not just man as vile as he can be, even though that is true. The teaching of total depravity, according to the Word of God, is that sin, our fallen state, has entered into every single part of the human existence. Sin is found in our mental faculties. Sin is found in our emotional nature. Sin is found in our very wills. Sin is found in the work of our hands. Sin is invasive, and and, and it's so invasive that it is even found inside of our dreams. Locked away inside of our subconscious regions of our minds that we don't even know it's there. How many of you know we have dreams that are even sinful? Sin is found in our vision. Sin is found in the imaginations of our heart. The Bible says that it's in a man's heart to do evil and continually in the sight of God. Sin is found in our relationships and sin is even found against our own bodies that we will even hurt our own bodies to sin. You and I sin in our mind. You and I sin in our volitional nature. You and I are depraved without the redemption of of God Almighty and the resurrected Savior. Can I hear an amen? Amen. The doctrine of depravity is sin has entered into every faculty of the human existence and you and I are fallen people. This is the doctrine of total depravity. Now I don't believe that there's any scripture in your Bible or my Bible that represents total depravity more than the one I just read in Luke chapter 23 where they crucified our Lord Jesus. So I want you to think with me for just a few moments today as we go to the cross. And I want you to think with me about the crucifixion of our Lord and how dramatic and how emphatic this illustration is. And this illustration is about human nature and how evil that we can be left to himself or herself. The crucifixion is a demonstration, a case study of the human nature that has fallen, that is cursed. For a moment, let your minds go back with me 2,000 years ago when they crucified our Lord. Look at our Lord Jesus with me. Imagine how He was crucified. First, let me ask you, was there ever a human more beautiful that has ever lived than Jesus Christ? The Bible described Him in 2 Corinthians 5 as a man without sin. He was perfect in all of His ways. Did you know Jesus was the only flawless human to ever enter in human existence, and yet here He is, judged by men. They paid witnesses to betray Him. They debauched Him. They defamed His name. Though He never did one single thing wrong, guys, this is total depravity on display. The human nature. Look with me again. Was there anyone who was so gracious in life and so beautiful in His emotions? And the expression of all the good that was in him is the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely, positively not. Simon Peter said in his sermon in the household of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. 
Jesus brought health. Jesus brought happiness. Jesus brought healing. Jesus brought curing. Jesus brought resurrection. Jesus brought forgiveness. Jesus brought mercy. He brought heaven everywhere He went. Was there anybody like Jesus? Was there anybody like our Lord? Yet look at Him on Calvary's day. Hanging upon the cross. They brought him before Pontius Pilate, and we read about it just a moment ago, and they accused him of being an insurrectionist and a seditionist, leading his people on a revolt against Caesar and the Roman Empire. They cried out for a murder, a man who was known for murder, convicted of murder, talking about injustice at its height. They cried for Barabbas to be released, and they treat Jesus like he is Barabbas, and they cry for him to be crucified crucified and they said crucify him not that one him did ever such gracious words fall from the lips of another mortal man who talked like jesus he even said himself my words are spirit and they are life to those who find them every word jesus spoke was beautiful he knew how to talk to the poorest he knew how to talk to the richest Jesus understood, and people understood Him, and everybody understood Jesus but the religious folk. There was nobody like Him. He could speak the Word of God in plain language. He would often use parables. He would use heavenly stories with earthly meanings. And all the while, every word He spoke was light and salvation, encouragement. It was the good news of the Gospel He preached. And the words He said were life, yet they still crucified Him. And the answer, question is, why? And the answer is, this is total depravity on display. Look at the Lord Jesus on the cross. Look at humanity and what we lost. They sought to trap Him, the man who spoke perfect words by His own words. The religious would figure and conjure up questions and they would ask Jesus trying to trap Him. Like two microphones opposing each other, they were constantly trying to trap Jesus with His words. If He answered one way, well, that wasn't right. If He answered another way, well, that wasn't right. How many of you know that sounds familiar today? Amen. So He couldn't speak, so they were trying to trap Him, and there was no end. It was entrapment. This is the degradation of humanity. How could you do this to the Word of God? All of us in this room who have bodies in here know that there's weakness in every single one of us. And this became apparent to me over the last few weeks walking the corridors of the hospital and watching the different patients that came in as mom was in the hospital. I began to notice and just began to be curious of all the people in the different walks of life that I saw in the hospital walking down the, the halls. One night on a Saturday night, there was not many people there, but apparently there was emergency open heart surgery. The woman came in, she was alone, she looked very wealthy. Her husband, later I would see him down in the PACU unit because that's where mom was for four days in critical condition. And I noticed they put him kind of next to mom there in the PACU. And you could tell even in his condition, he looked like a man of influence. And what I noticed about that is that all of us, no matter how rich we are, how poor we are, what walk of life we come from, our bodies are decaying. Am I right? So our bodies, we see depravity in our own body. There's no one in this room listening today or by media today that has a perfect body. Why? The power of sin. Our eyes are weak. I'm in the 40, my 40s now and I can tell you my eyes are getting weaker. That's why it took a long time to read a while ago. <laughs> our ears are weak. Our muscles are weak. Our emotions are weak. No one has ever had a perfect human body and mind except Jesus. And you and I display the fall of the Garden of Eden in every single tip of our body, from our fingertips to our toe tips. Every physician will tell you that we're all dying. Death is nothing more than sickness walking slow. No matter how strong we are, no matter how, how many weights we lift, no matter how much nutrition we take in, left alone long enough, our bodies one day will take a dirt nap. Okay? I said our bodies. I didn't say our spirits. I said our bodies one day will take a dirt nap. Why? Because of total depravity. Because of sin. This is the power of imperfection and sin, but not with the Lord Jesus. Jesus had a perfect body, 
It was framed by the Holy Spirit Himself in the virgin womb of Mary. Don't know if He was short or tall. Don't know if He was muscled up or skinny, but it doesn't matter to me. All I know is the Holy Ghost formed that body and it was unlike any body that we've ever known. Come on, church. Think about it when He was... When he went into the temple and he drove out the money changers, think about that. One man, one man drove everybody out of the mall. Think about that. One man. Why? Because he was God in the flesh, but yet he was man. Think about that. Beautiful body just hanging on that cross, being ripped to pieces. Look at his body. They drove nails through his feet and his hands. Second chapter of Ezekiel says he was marred like no other man. In other words, he didn't look like a man when they got through with him. This is total depravity on display. They scourged him. They plucked out his beard. They sped upon him. And last of all, a Roman soldier thrust a spear into his body cavity. The only perfect body to walk this planet is marred by sinful man. This is depravity on display. Let me give you some places, and I I won't take you to the Scriptures, but I'll give you the illustrations. In the Garden of Eden, God's beautiful creation, sin entered the garden through Adam and Eve. And because of that today, you and I are still suffering today because of that choice. God said on that day that you eat the fruit, you will surely die. And boy, has death been working on mankind for about six to 7,000 biblical years. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Satan always beguiles us. He ruins us. He destroys us. He takes away God's Word from us. Depravity entered the human existence and human condition. And with every people, group, and generation, God is always trying to get people back to Him. Then Noah. We go to Noah in the flood. Everybody's familiar with Noah. As soon as Noah got off the boat, and remember, God wiped out the whole world. He he wiped it clean and he started over. This is beautiful redemption, creation. And yet Noah morrowed it. He morrows it by getting drunk. If you'll remember reading the story. God gave you and I language. Animals have sounds, but you and I uh, have, have language. We have communication skills. There's no creature on earth that has communication skills like we do. Language is such a beautiful thing that it can unite people. It can pull people together. It's where we get songs. It's where we get poetry. And they built a tower. Remember, they built a tower trying to get to God. God gave man a beautiful language, and man trespasses against God. So God has to come down and confuse the language. Then after that, God chooses a people to redeem. There's always a way out God makes. So man can find who he really is. So God chooses a people and he gives them his name. And he said, I have chosen you. And in the 19th chapter of Exodus, he said that you may represent me, that I am Jehovah God. And even that, as we know, gets messed up. Why is it that God always redeems man and gives us a brand new start? No matter how good we start off, we always go into depravity state. Why? Because all of us, the Bible says, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Finally, let me get to the New Testament. What a beautiful introduction we have in the book of Luke. Here's this magnificent little girl named Mary. The song of Elizabeth and her kinsman, her kinswoman. Zechariah, Bethlehem, shepherds and wise men. A beautiful Christmas story. And in the middle of this beautiful story, here's King Herod slaughtering baby boys two years old and younger. Think about how awful that was. My question was, how is that even possible? On one hand, you have this beautiful redemption. And on the other hand, you have depravity at its finest, working to destroy life itself. You follow the story of Jesus through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then Jesus gives birth to the church. And Jesus said about the church, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 that Christ so loved the church that He gave His self for her. That He gave Himself for the church. The church is supposed to be a place of glory. And I read to you in Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32, and Jesus described the church and the kingdom of God as a mustard seed and it grows into a large tree. But no matter how beautiful the tree is, no matter how glorious the tree becomes, the birds of the air come and nest in it. And a lot of times in Scripture, not all the time, but a lot of times, birds in scriptures, Scripture represents evil spirits. And the evil spirits, the birds, will come and nest in this glorious church. So what Jesus was saying is, left alone long enough, man will come in and mess up the church without a move of the Holy Spirit. 
Corruption will come into every part of it. Why? Why is it that the church doesn't have an impact anymore that we once had? We have the biggest churches and the least influence than we've ever had in human history. Why? Because we've allowed birds and evil things to come into God's glorious church. This is depravity. This is depravity. If you don't believe in depravity, just go hang out with some church folk. They come into church and you can spot them a mile away with their big black Bible. And they sit on the pews of our churches judging everyone and with their backslidden heart from their little religious paradigm. Judging everybody. Why? Because of depravity. Depravity. Everybody shout out depravity. Let me finish with coming to the modern era. Never before has there ever been a nation influenced and influent and blessed as America. Nobody is as blessed as America has been. You know, you can take the poorest American that has lights, running water, and a cell phone. Even homeless people have a cell phone. You take the poorest people who have one of these, one of these privileges, lights, running water, and a cell phone, and did you know they are as rich as a family that lived 200 years ago with 31 servants in their house? America has been blessed. It's been astonishing. America is one of the wonders of the world. It's overwhelming when you think about America, the blessing that has been upon the nation of America. Yet look at us now. I said look at us now. How did we get here? How did we get to where we are? We're actually having hearings in the court of law about gender and genital infant mutilation. We can't even agree upon when life starts in the mother's womb. We turn our televisions on and there's corruption on every channel. Corruption. Depravity. You say, well, it's a Democrat thing. You say, no, it's a Republican thing. No, it's a sin thing. I said it's a sin thing. And it is depravity on display. Sociologists and the economic, uh, economists say that we need to solve the social unrest in the world and we need more money. That's always the answer. We need more money. We need more stimulus. We need more programs. And I'm not saying there's not injustice going on and I'm not saying that there's not things that we need to deal with in this country, but I want to tell you something. You can take a thief and you can dress him up in the finest clothes and you can send him to Harvard. But he, when he comes out of Harvard, listen to me, when he comes out of Harvard, he's still going to be a thief. If he's a thief in his heart, he's still going to be a thief. I don't care if you put him in Nemus Marcus and put the best clothes on him. He's just going to be a thief with more influence. The old timers used to say you can dress up a pig. You can put lipstick on a pig, but he'll find his way back to the pig pen and wallow in the mud with all the clothes and makeup you put on him. Why is that? Because at the end of the day, he's still a pig. I said, he's still a pig. And listen to me, you can't change a man till you change the man on the inside. I said, you can't change a man till you change the man on the inside. And we got to change on the inside. Listen, more programs, more funding is not going to do it. We got to change in here. Come on, church, we got to change in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't care how good America tries to make it look. I don't care what pretty package they put around it and try to sell it to us. I don't care how Hollywood displays it on television and how much we accept it. At the end of the day, it's still sin. It's still depravity on display. And we got to recognize that and the church has got to wake up. So what are we going to do? What is the answer? The fallen nature has affected everything. Depravity has hit every single sector of the human condition. Aren't you glad God didn't leave us in our damnation? Because there's this little holiday that happens at the end of March and in April. A little holiday we call Easter. And it's more than just a little holiday. (laughs) Because it's the only cure for depravity. Where there's judgment, God gives mercy. And right now, we are in a window of grace. But I want to talk about judgment for a moment because, guys, we got to get real. And we've muzzled the pastors in our pulpits. I said we've muzzled the pastors in our pulpits too long. And it's time that we preach the truth. 
Let me talk about the judgment of God for a moment. Do you know war is the judgment of God? Do you know poverty is the judgment of God? Injustice is the judgment of God? Sexual immorality, according to Romans chapter 1, is the judgment of God. America's trying right now to make it all look good, but America can't deliver itself until we get right with God. But they're trying their best to make it look good and be accepted and socially accepted. You can say that I won't be judged because that's the big thing right now. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. I don't want any authority telling me anything. Don't judge me. Don't tell me anything. Come on, church. I can break the commandments of God and escape, but I'm telling you, you can't escape. You might as well go to the tallest building in, in El Dorado, Arkansas. And to my knowledge, that's the first financial bank downtown. And you might as well jump off and say, watch me defile the laws of gravity as we watch you die. Because you can't break the law of gravity and you cannot break the commandments of God. Come on, church. The Bible says the wages. Come on, give him a hand. The Bible says wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So what is the answer today for America? What is the answer today for America, church? Come on, what is the answer? Jesus. Come on, what is the answer for America? Jesus. Come on, let's, let me ask you this. What is the answer for the church? Jesus. What is the answer for poverty? Jesus. What is the answer for civil unrest? Jesus. What is the answer for social unity? Jesus. Jesus. Everybody shout it out, Jesus. Jesus. There is only one answer for every question that plagues the human condition. Only one solution. J-E-S-U-S. Jesus. Yes. Come on, church. Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Listen to me. I'm going to preach. I got to get rid of them notes. I got to preach. Let me tell you something today. We need to get Jesus, number one, back in our hearts. And number two, we need to get Jesus back in our homes. And number three, we need to get Jesus back in the church because if we get Jesus back in the church, he'll spill out of the church and go to every corner of America again. Come on, we need more Jesus. We need more Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands like it's a hold up and just praise Him right now. Father, we thank You. Lord, we need Jesus. We need Jesus. We need Jesus, Lord. We need You in our lives. We need You in our lives. You are the answer, Lord. Your risen Savior is the answer. You are the answer today. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. Come on, just bear with me for a moment. Pastor Daniel, come and I'm going to close. I'm going to exit a lot of this. Or ex a lot of this. Why do we have church called One Community in El Dorado, Arkansas? Why is there a church? Why did God call us to put a church here? When there's hundreds of churches in El Dorado, Union County, Arkansas, and I'm not knocking any of them, but anybody that'll preach more Jesus, we need more of them. Amen. We need more of them. I'm so excited about this church being here. And I'm so excited about what God is already doing, but guys, we're just getting started. And one thing that I hear a lot that, that really bothers me and I've heard this a lot when we moved over here and I hear it even now and I want this vocabulary to change. Our verbiage needs to change. But I've heard people say so many times when I tell them, well, we bought the old Emanuel building and we're over there on Southwest Avenue and this is what I hear. There's drugs over there. That's a bad neighborhood. There's a lot of drugs over there south of town. <laughs> Let me tell you something, there's drugs everywhere. You take the finest neighborhood in El Dorado, Arkansas, the most elite neighborhood in El Dorado, Arkansas, and there's drugs there too. What was it, last week or so was spring break? I don't remember. I've lost track of time with mom, but I was driving through one of the most influential neighborhoods in our city, one of them in the city limits of El Dorado. And I saw kids that were barely 13 years old with their American Eagle clothes and their Nike shoes in the middle of the day, not hiding from anybody, smoking joints. There's drugs everywhere. There's a lot of drugs and there's a lot going on in every neighborhood in El Dorado. And guys, we need more Jesus. We need more Jesus. So don't tell me it's just over there or over here. Let me ask you a question. When did Christians get scared of everything? When did we get scared of everything? What are we going to do about that? We're going to preach Jesus. We're going to pull them in and we're going to tell them, listen, you don't have to live in poverty. You don't have to live in sexual immorality. We're going to preach Jesus to them because He is the only answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Come on, church. That's what the apostles preached. They preached repentance that you might be saved because the coming of the Lord is at hand, the ultimate refreshing and rejuvenation. Repent and be converted. 
I want to give you one more passage and then I'll close and I'm going to give an altar call in just a moment. Revelation, the closing of the Bible, Revelations 22, 17, the Holy Spirit said, John, do not close the book until I make one more final ultimate appeal. Your Bible closes with these words, the Spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears come. Let whoever is thirsty come. And I can still hear my dad say, and whoever so will, whoever wills, let them come. Let them come freely. Let them come freely. Here's the deal. Do you know the depths of depravity has never been plumbed? The depths of depravity have never been plumbed. You say, well, pastor, what about Ted Bundy? That was depraved. What about Jeffrey Dahmer killed people in a bombing in Oklahoma? What about serial killers who eat human body parts? That's depraved, yes. But it's not the bottom of depravity. What about Adolf Hitler, pastor? He killed 13 to 16 million people. That's depraved, yes, but it's not the depths of depravity. I want to teach you something today, and I've, I've, I've taught you this in a roundabout way, but I want to just come out bluntly and say it. There's two restrainers of evil in the world. Two. Two restrainers of evil in the world today. Number one is the Holy Spirit. That's why I've been preaching on it for four weeks. will soon be five weeks. So the, restra- the, one of the number one restrainer of evil right now is the Holy Spirit. The number two restrainer of evil is is the church. And I preached for five weeks on that at the beginning of the year. So there's two restrainers of evil in the world, the Holy Spirit and the church. Everybody say the Holy Spirit and the church. You take these two out and you haven't seen anything yet. You take these two out and you haven't seen anything. Adolf Hitler doesn't hold a candle to the Antichrist and what he will do. And I think it's very possible that he's alive today. There's a day coming that just like on Easter Sunday morning that we celebrate today when Christ came out of that grave and was risen. That was just the first resurrection. Because there's another one coming. <laughs> there's another one coming. And one day, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says, the dead in Christ will rise. And those that are alive and remain will be caught up to meet Him in the air. And we will forever be with the Lord. Listen, He's coming back. And resurrection's not over. Resurrection has just begun because He's going to resurrect His church. I said He's going to resurrect His church. People say, and this is something, this is a pet peeve. But people say, well, the church shouldn't be in politics. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. Church should be in politics. Church should be in history. Church should be in history. Church should be in education. Church should be in the court of law. Church should be in every aspect and sector of our country. Why? Because we push back evil. I said we push back evil. You think it's bad now? Wait until the church is gone because we hold depravity at bay. I said, we hold depravity at bay. Come on, church. We hold depravity at bay. Hallelujah. I don't care how saved you are. I don't care how long you've come to church. There's an old man inside of you that wants to come back to life. It's like those paddles they put on you. You let somebody pull out in front of you or start cussing you, and that old man will come out of you real quick. That old woman will come out of you. Come on, church. Bring you back to life. Why is that? Because of depravity. It's the fallen nature of man and what sin has done since it entered the world in the Garden of Eden. Jesus is the only answer in Him crucified and resurrected. Jesus crucified and resurrected. He is risen, church. I said He is risen. He is risen indeed. I want to close the service today and give an altar call today, and I want everybody to listen to me just for a moment. If you're here today and you're watching by media, in fact, I want you just to go ahead and stand with me if you would. 
with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give an altar call on Easter Sunday morning. If Jesus is not the absolute, complete Lord of your life, if you're here and you've not repented and been converted, listen to me, I use two key words. You have not, been repent, you have not repented and converted. I'm not just talking about changing your mind. I'm talking about changing your life. Listen, I, I want you to listen to me because I would never lie to you. I, I don't want to lie to you, guys. The time is too short for me to stand up here and give a nice little poetic sermonette. Time is running out and Jesus is coming and I don't want to lie to you. I don't care how many times you have prayed the sinner's prayer. I don't care how many times you've been to church and how many services you've attended, how many Easter services you've attended. If you call yourself a Christian but it did not change the way you live, you need to rethink that decision. Did you hear what I just said? If you call yourself a Christian and it's not changing the way you're living, then you need to rethink that. Here's the, here the plea of the Lord today. If you call yourself a Christian and it doesn't change the way you live, you might be convicted, but you haven't been converted. Listen to me. You may have been convicted, but have you been converted? Because when you're converted, there will be a change. And there's a difference between conviction and converted. When I get to heaven, I want to see all of you, not just some of you. I want to see every one of you there. And the way to ensure that is to make sure that Jesus is the absolute Lord of your life. This is not to say you'll be perfect, but if you have imperfections, listen, if you have imperfections, and we all do, you're going to be grieved. The Holy Spirit is going to be grieved inside of you every time, and you're going to go, no, no, I don't need to do that. He's going to change the way you live. So listen to me. There's three appeals today that I want to give you today. Three. Number one. I want you to repent of every known sin. Every known sin. Number two, I want you to make everything right with other people. Did y'all hear me? You got to get right with people. I want you, number three, to make every wrong right. Every wrong right. So number one, re re repent of every known sin. Number two, you have to be right with people. And number three, make every wrong right. Listen to me. God is going to move in this church, and I'm saying that today. There's going to be a move of God in this church right here on 701 Southwest Avenue. God is going to do some amazing things, but listen to me. He cannot move here. He cannot move here if there's things in our heart. He cannot move here if we've got ought against our brother or sister. We've got to get right with God. We've got to repent of every known sin if we want to see a move of God. And here's the last one. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to come and take over your life and to lead you every day. That's what it takes to get right with God. You say, Pastor, well, that's strict. No, I'm tired of being a Christian who doesn't have backbone to stand in adversity. We don't need spineless Christians. We need some strong Christian believers. Come on, church. Repent of every known uh, sin. Make a stand for Jesus. Pastor, what you're describing, I'm not there. Pastor, what you're describing, I'm not there. I need to put Jesus on the throne of my life because I've been on the throne of my life for too long. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to do two things. I'm fixing to be bold, and I'm going to ask you to do two things on Easter Sunday. Two things. Number one, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a moment. I'm going to give an invitation, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And the second thing I'm going to do is ask you to come to the front. I'm going to ask you to come to the altar. You say, why? Because I, I believe we shouldn't be ashamed of God. The Bible, God said, if, Jesus said, if you're not ashamed of me before me, and I will not be ashamed of you before my Father and His holy angels. There are so many churches today that won't even give an altar call because they're of fear that you may offend somebody for doing something courageous for Jesus. I don't want you to be afraid to do something courageous for Jesus. I believe that we're in a different time and I believe there's a group of people here and you, and you know that you, you're tired of just status quo Christian stuff and you want more. Listen, I would rather offend the whole world than offend Jesus. Than to offend Jesus and be right with the world. 
I don't want to do that. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I'm not where I need to be. Jesus is not the total Lord of my life, and I want Him to be the total Lord of my life. If you're here and you've got bitterness and unforgiveness towards another human being, if you're in this room, if you're in the balcony, if you're here today and you've got ought against somebody else, unforgiveness in your life, you need to get it right today. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Today you need to get right. I don't care. Whatever it is inside of you today on Easter Sunday, whatever God is dealing with you about you need to get it right today you need to get it right today so I'm going to ask you here in just a moment and you can if you got honestly say pastor I'm not 100% where I need to be then you need to be a part of this call so I'm going to give the call y'all ready one two three if that's you raise your hand I need to get right with God man goodness there's hands going up everywhere I need to get right with God I need to get right with God. I've got things in my heart that are not right toward other people. I need to get right with God. Come on, any, I think there's more hands should go up. I think there's more people. I, God sees those hands. Keep them lifted. Keep them lifted. Keep them lifted. Come on, worship team to the platform. I need the worship team to the platform if you would. Pastor Daniel, you're going to flow with me for just a moment. But here's what we're going to do. I want you, if you raised your hand in the balcony or on the floor, if you're in the balcony, there's staircases on each side that will lead you into this room. But if you're in this room or in the balcony, I need you to come up front right now. We're going to pray for you. Come on, right now. Come on, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Come on, come to the front. Come to the front. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's people coming. Come on, come to the front. Come to the front. Come on, give them a hand today. Come on, they're coming. Come stand right here, Spencer. Stand right there, Mama. Stand right there. Come here, face me. Face me. Y'all face me. Come on, look at these folks coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! Praise the Lord. Look at here, look at here, look at here. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Come on, church. Guys, if you're standing down here, I want you to do something for me. I want you right now just to begin to pray. Would you do that? Just begin to pray. Come on, just begin to pray. I got things in my heart that's not right. I got things against other people. Listen, if you want to come down here, there's still time. There's still time to come. There's still time to come. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we praise you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Here's some folks. More folks coming. Come on. More folks are coming. Come on. I see some more back there. Come on. Clap your hands, church. Come on. There's more coming. More coming. Hallelujah. 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 God, we praise you. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. I need some uh, elders. I need some uh, folks in our church, Bob and Brother Wayne and other people. Come on, stand behind these that are here. Come on, some of our main folks. Come on, I need the core people up here. Come on, stand behind these and just pray for them right now. Come on, pray, start praying. Just pray for them. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Billy, come on, let's pray. Come on, let's pray right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you, Jesus. Bill and Tammy. I've watched God totally change your life since you've been here. How long have you been at OCC now? A little over a year. Has there been transformation? And in 130 day, you're going to come to Next Steps class, but you know what you're doing right now? You're doing the main step, which is I want to get everything right between here and heaven. And I love that you're a husband and wife coming and you're joined together because you're saying, I'm going to make this decision together. I make this decision together. Come on, I don't know, would there be other husbands and wives that need to make some decisions? I think there's other husbands and wives up front. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we just give you glory right now. We give you glory right now. We give you praise. Come on, sing that song, Amen. Amen, amen. This is what I want you to do. If you walked up front today, I want you to pray this prayer with me. We're going to pray the prayer of David. Everybody repeat after me. I want everybody in, in this front area and even those in the audience to repeat after me. Say, Lord, create in me a pure heart and renew a right spirit within me. Jesus, forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. I repent of every sin right now. Lord, I, if there's anything in my heart that's not like you, if I've got unforgiveness against my brother, or my sister. I lay it here in this altar to never pick it up again. And I got some homework to do because I need to go to them and I need to ask forgiveness. And I need to love on them. And it doesn't matter what they do, you forgive them. You forgive them. Father, I thank you right now that you're forgiving folks right now. Everybody say this. Say, Lord, I give my heart to you totally and completely. I want to make you the Lord of my life on Easter Sunday morning. And I thank you for it right now. 
in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Give the Lord a big hand clap of praise right now. Come on. Give him a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.